Instrumental variables take two. We want to move away from what's obviously a very unrealistic framework. If you think about the draft lottery estimating the effects of Vietnam era military service, most people who served in the Vietnam era armed forces volunteered. So the effect of being forced in and volunteering for something, probably not the same. Uh, the general point here, the kind of uh, context for this, is a, an interesting uh, distinction between different types of validity in social science. And um, this, this language comes from uh, other social scientists. It's not something that was part of the economics canon until recently. Internal and external validity. So a good instrument gives you some kind of experiment. It's, it captures an internally valid causal effect on somebody. It's the causal effect of being forced into the army for people who are drafted. The, the, a separate question, and somebody asked me about this, in fact, yesterday in the context of the Dale and Kruger study, what is the predictive value of that estimate for other times and places or for other situations that are sort of superficially similar but may differ in important details? Uh, so the draft lottery uh, tells me about the effects of being forced into serve in, a, in an armed forces that's of a different time and place than today's armed forces. Um, quarter birth estimates, there's a couple of things going on there that are maybe noteworthy. Uh, one is um, the uh, actual extra schooling. That's not an experiment, for example, for college, which is maybe the most interesting margin for American young people today. Almost everybody graduates high school. Well, the compulsory attendance laws don't force you to go to college. So uh, uh, I'm not learning about the economic returns to a bachelor's degree from that experiment. And then there's also the fact that the mechanism there, people who want to drop out of high school, maybe that's a, a special population. So um, I want to give you some machinery to think concretely about these kind of heterogeneity and nonlinearity issues. Uh, and I'll motivate that machinery with a particular example that's related to the causal effects of family size of childbearing on maternal uh, labor supply. The theoretical context for this is the theory of instrumental variables in a heterogeneous world, which of course is the real world. And uh, the formal results there, the local average treatment effects framework that Imbins, Hito Imbins and I developed years ago and uh, others have kept on working on and developing. Uh, that framework reveals, in a very precise sense, uh, the idea that we get a particular average causal effect for a particular subpopulation, and that in a, in a model where uh, the treatment of interest is, is multi-valued, like an ordered treatment, like years of schooling, uh, we're getting treatment effects over a particular range. Uh, not necessarily for all values of schooling, but a kind of a weighted average derivative for particular values. Uh, but we can figure out what those weights are. We can estimate them and study them and use them to think uh, uh, about external validity. Okay, so that brings me to the following empirical question, which is where do babies come from? So uh, I had to, uh, I was fortunate I got to relearn this a few months ago with the birth of my granddaughter. And uh, well, no, everybody knows where babies come from. So babies are delivered by uh, a stork. Uh, and, um, but it's a myth that babies are dropped down the chimney, but that mostly they would, chimney is too small and uh, violates code. So, uh, and there's the stork and the stork uh, produces some kind of experimental uh, variation in, in family size. Uh, for two reasons. One is uh, sometimes the stork picks up, uh, uh, mostly the stork delivers one baby per, per, per shipment, okay, <laughs> per household, but sometimes the stork delivers two uh, because it just makes a mistake, say, and picks up too many. Uh, and then there's something else that's uh, more about the parents, and that has to do with the sex composition of the babies. So. Um, the uh, 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 way this works in some countries is that um, uh, the sex of a child affects fertility, say, through sun preference. 
So in South uh, Asia and some parts of East Asia in particular, um, the um, parents would like to have boys. Uh, Americans and actually Latin Americans don't care too much about that. What American parents want is a diversified sibling sex portfolio. So the way that works is if you have two boys or two girls, and it actually doesn't matter much. So this is among women with at least two. Okay, so then are they same sex or mixed sex? So if they're mixed sex, you're kind of happy and you stop. But if they're same sex, either two boys or two girls, that has a large effect on the probability of having a third child. So here are the, uh, here's the econometric framework that we're going to use to exploit that. The question is how that third child affects maternal labor supply. Uh, this is interesting uh, because um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about women, and the data from this study come from a paper that Bill Evans and I uh, wrote years ago. Um, uses data from the 1960, 70, 80, and 90 censuses. And what's happening over that period is maternal, uh, uh, married women uh, are really starting to work at a high, high rate. So traditionally, or at least, well, I don't know, traditionally, but up until uh, the 70s, more or less, um, you know, single women always worked, and they had to support themselves, but married women would not work. In fact, some employers had a policy of firing married women, or married women would just quit. And then that changed um, for, you know, all sorts of reasons that are the subject of a separate line of inquiry. So uh, female labor supply is going way up, mostly driven by increasing work among married women. At the same time, fertility is going down. Uh, and most fertility is marital fertility. And what happens, uh, happened in that time is uh, uh, completed family size for a married couple in the United States used to be about three. And then it falls to two. So the third child disappears. I I'm a great example of that, you know, in terms of my family line. I'm the oldest of three. And then I have two children. Okay, so I'm right on track for my cohort. And um, it could, it's interesting to think about that because we're very interested in the forces that drive female labor force participation and male-female wage convergence, uh, gender gaps and of all kinds. And one of the things that may be driving that is declining fertility. So we'd like to get the causal effect there. But of course, the Y0 here is almost surely correlated with the treatment. So what is the treatment? The treatment is the birth of a third child to uh, a sample of mostly married women who have two. And then the question is, what is the effect of the third child on female labor supply uh, in that population? And we have to worry that, you know, uh, it's not an experiment. So that's why we're going to come up with instruments, okay? So it's certainly the case that women who have more children earn less and work less, but that need not be causal. Again, that could be selection bias. The causality could even go the other way. Okay, there's sort of some preference uh, or some behavior, low labor force attachment that's causing fertility instead of the other way around. So I'd like to have an experiment that deals with the fact that Y0 and D are correlated so that I can estimate the causal effect here. Now, I've written this in Greek as if it's constant, but we'll see very soon in the data that it's not constant. So just to make it concrete, here are the dependent variables. This is, again, a sample of married, mostly married women, uh, and in some cases, all married women, uh, their employment, their hours worked, their weeks worked last year, and their earnings. Uh, everybody has at least two kids, but some people have three. So the endogenous variable, the thing that I'm looking for a good experiment for, and that's where my twin and my same-sex uh, stork action is going to come in, okay, is I need an instrument for this third child, okay? And my instruments are either a multiple second birth, so because if you have a multiple second birth, you know, buy one, get one free. You had a second shipment, and now you have three children even though you only had two shipments delivered, we'll say, okay? 
Um, and maybe that happens randomly. Okay, it doesn't actually happen randomly anymore. So you can't use the twins experiment today because twinning is very highly correlated with IVF and other fertility enhancing technologies. And that is very much uh, an upper income phenomenon. So twin birth rates have skyrocketed and they're highly correlated in modern data with female education and earnings potential. But going back to the 80s, that probably wasn't true. Twin birth rates were about 1%, and it was probably pretty random. And then the other thing is, remember, everybody in my data have at least two children. So I'm going to use a dummy for whether it's a same-sex sib ship. And the idea is same-sex sib ships increase subsequent childbearing. Okay. And there is a first stage for that, you'll see. And uh, very much, again, my own family history is, um, you know, kind of aligned with this. So I'm the firstborn. And uh, then uh, my mother uh, had a second child, my middle uh, brother. So now uh, that's same sex equals one, two boys. And my mother really wanted a girl, so she had a third child, and that's our youngest brother, Ezra. Um, and uh, as we like to remind him, he was a big disappointment from birth. So um, just kidding. Here's the IV thing, very straightforward. Bernoulli instrument, twins. You either have one or you don't. It's either multiple or you don't. And um, of course, you observe whether the baby, the children in the household are boys or girls. So both Bernoulli instruments, z equals one, z equals zero. Here's my reduced form. Here's my first stage. And my IV formula becomes the Wald formula. So this is an example of Wald. And uh, there we go. OK, there's a picture of two of my instruments. This is both same sex and same sex and uh, twins, as it happens. And they came out wearing those t-shirts. It's amazing. <laughs> Mostly harmless t-shirts. So here's the wall table, OK, for the two instruments. And uh, there's a lot going on in this table, but it's a fun table, so let's look at it. The twins' first stage is done for the 1980 census. And what happens is, um, this is the more than two. This is counting the number of children. Let's not worry about that. OK. So the effect of a multiple birth on um, the effect on, of a multiple birth on the treatment of having more than two, OK, the effect of a multiple birth on the treatment of having more than two is, is, is what's shown there uh, that I, OK. Uh, uh, in that column, what column is it? Uh, it's not numbered, but there, okay, 0.6. Okay, so that's the first stage. Okay, interpret that. That's a little bit of an interesting number. Can you interpret that, Zach? Can you use it in a sentence? So I'll give you a hint what I'm thinking about. Ordinarily, you think of children as being shipped in integer multiples, but this is a fraction. OK, so what's going on there? Why is the first stage 0.6? Probability of having. Very good, right. OK, so now explain it. It's increase in probability by 0.6. Exactly. OK, so, so what, what, is, what is one minus that? 0.4. OK, so the first stage effect must be a probability. Yep. How likely is a woman who doesn't have twins to have a third child? 0.4. Exactly. That's what this number reveals, OK? Lots of women will have three children without the benefit of the twin push, OK? Lots of women will have three children without the benefit of the twin push. 40% uh, of women will have three children without the benefit of twins. Then having a twin takes something that happens with probability 0.4 and turns it into what? Turns it into what, Chandler? turns it into what's the probability of having three children when you do have a twin twins on second birth somebody who has a multiple second birth what's the probability they have three children one 
Right. So the first stage here is kind of interesting to think about. It takes 0.4 and turns it into a certainty. It's a huge, you know, in terms of instrumental variables, it's a huge first stage. Okay. And then why is it a fraction? Because the endogenous variable is a dummy, so it's the probability. Okay, so it's taking something that happens to lots of people. They're going to choose anyway to have a twin, I mean, to have a three children. And I'm just goosing this by 0.6 by virtue of having the, the twin thing. And then over here, uh, let me get back there so I can write, over here, the first stage for sex mix. Okay, and I'm not distinguishing two boys from two girls. It's interesting that it really doesn't, it isn't about that in the United States. It's about same versus mixed. The sex mix first stage is 0.06. The underlying numbers here are 0.37 and 0.43. So what happens is 37% of a mixed sex sib ship, 37% of mothers to a mixed sex sib ship are likely, 37% uh, 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 not likely, but 37% is the probability that the mothers of a mixed-sex sib ship have a third child. And then uh, having a same-sex sib ship adds six points to that. So another thing that's interesting is the twins' first stage is huge, but it doesn't happen to very many people. Only 1% have twins. The sex-mixed first stage is a tenth as large, but half of us or half of this sample has a same-sex sib ship. 25% have two boys, 25% have two girls, because the probability of a boy is about 0.51, and that's independent. So you just square it to get two boys, and you square it to get two girls. So different order of magnitude in terms of the size of the first stage, but also much broader population kind of treated here by the instrument in some ways, okay? Now, let's look down here at the reduced forms. So here's the twins reduced form for work for pay, weeks worked, hours, labor, income. Okay, mothers of twins, everybody had two, remember, but if you had a multiple second birth, you work about 4.5% percentage points less. The twins first stage is 0.6, and so the ratio is minus 0.76. That's the ratio of this number to this number. This number divided by this number. And here, mothers of twins, they work about two weeks fewer than singleton mothers at second birth. Divide by 0.6, three weeks. Hours, this, these numbers sort of just by chance come out to be similar. It's not a typo. Two hours per week. Divide, okay, so there's my walled estimate. My walled estimate of the effect of twinning is that a third birth born as a consequence of twinning reduces labor supply by 7.6 points on the participation margin, 3.3 weeks worked, 3.3 hours, and about $1,000 fewer lower wages. Those are large effects. I'm not showing you in the table here because I'm concentrating on the IV aspect of the story, the OLS numbers are even larger. So there's a lot of selection bias in the OLS. The OLS is too big, indeed, as we would think, okay? So the OLS estimates just run a regression on a dummy for more than two kids, quite a bit larger than these twins, maybe double the twins estimate, okay? So there's definitely some selection bias, but that's not the point for the moment. Let's go over here and look at the sex mix algebra. So mothers of a same-sex sib ship, a little bit less than one point reduced participation, about 0.38 weeks, about a third of an hour. Much smaller reduced forms, $132 lower earnings. Two boys or two girls, combine the mothers of two boys or two girls, Contrast their labor supply with mothers of mixed sex sib ship. One boy, one girl. Don't worry about the order. Okay. All these margins are lower. Okay. But now divide by the first stage. And there's my IV estimate. 
Participation effect of a third child, 13 points. Weeks worked because of a third child, 6.4 weeks fewer, 5.2 hours fewer, $2,200 lower earnings. Even more negative than twins. Two instruments, I think they're both valid, two instruments. I love them both equally, like my children, okay? But the sex mix instrument for the same causal relationship differs, I mean, not the instrument, but the, the estimate produced using the sex mix instrument for the same causal relationship differs from the estimate produced using the twins instrument. So that immediately tells me, well, it's not a constant effects world. If I like both of these instruments, if I think both of these instruments are, are valid, okay, then there must be something else going on which has something to do with the nature of the underlying experiment. Why would, in fact, it's kind of even counterintuitive in a sense because, you know, if you think about it, I know many of you are, are parents, you might think, you know, that twins experiment, that twins experiment is, um, you know, kind of worse in a way, right? It's a bigger, from the point of view of the economics of the household, the twins experiment is, is you know, a bigger shock uh, because you had that extra child and now um, also very tight spacing, you know, uh, so you have the extra child. So, why, why are these, and then you might say, well, you know what, maybe they're not statistically different. So actually I'll tell you, if we just say, look at the, at the second column, 13 points with a standard error of 2.6 is statistically different if you tested in a formal test. It is statistically different from 7.6 points with a standard error of 1.4 or 6.4 weeks in the second column is statistically different from 3.3. Okay, so why, why is the twins IV estimate, you know, smaller in terms, you know, is the labor supply consequences of the twins experiment, when that produces a third child, are smaller? So that's such an interesting question. You know, maybe there's some economics there. Any theories on that? Any theories on why that would be? No radius or your burden of care. So that's a good one. So there's something else that's going on there, which is the nature of the experiment is a little different. You're kind of saying, Tamer, if, that it's, it's like efficient. I'm home anyway, looking after the second. I'm, I don't even notice that, that that third child is there. You know, a friend of mine described it as, you know, I switch from man to man to zone defense when, uh, when you have twins. So that's a possible, and there, there's some story there. Um, yeah, do you have a, another idea? Maybe the surprise third child creates financial strain, and so then the mother works more, or, or doesn't reduce work as much. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. Now, one thing I could tell you, though, and you can actually see this in the table. Look at the bottom row. Family income doesn't change much. Look at the bottom row, the log of family income. So the, the walled estimate in 1980 of the family income effect is not significantly different from zero. That's because in this period, for these, these are women who are having children. They're married women who are having children. Their income, their earnings are not a big part of family earnings. So that's a, that's a good conjecture, but that's not probably what's going on here. Actually, you might think that, that the husbands, that's what labor economists would call an income effect. You might think the husbands are kind of having that, uh, and the, but there's not much evidence for them even either. Um, but I think somebody has, uh, uh, might be on to that idea. Well, in the back, somebody had their hand up. Yeah. Um, when you have a third child that's not your twin, you have to delay their return to work. You give up more. Um, not clear. Perhaps. Perhaps. Well, actually, maybe it goes the other way because it's tightened. It's tightened, right? The children, that's the closest spacing you ever get. For the twins. For the twins. Yeah, which is why we would see we would give up more, knowing we have two children, same sex. I want a third. 
then I'll delay the decision to go back to work because then I will be pregnant and have another baby. Right. So the, so the gap is smaller for twins. Sorry, I thought you said the other. So right. So that's kind of the efficiency argument. There's something else going on here that's a little, uh, a little bit more, uh, 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 I think, less surprising until you think of it. You, you have a suggestion? So women who want to their third child after having the first to the same sex, I mean, differ from the women who don't want to get the third child after having the first two. Yes, I like that line of reasoning. Let's make it concrete. How does a woman who has a third child by virtue of twinning, what's her target fertility? Her target fertility is two. Exactly. But she ended up with three. Exactly. The woman who has a third child because of twinning, that means that she would not have chosen to have a third child otherwise. That third child was imposed on her. On average, that's a more educated woman with higher earnings potential. What do more educated women do about childcare? They hire. They hire. And the fact that you hire childcare instead of producing it at home yourself mitigates the labor supply consequences. So that, that I think, is also a big part of this story. Uh, uh, Yvonne fernandez Val and I have a paper that kind of fleshes this out. And it, it shows you that, you know, even though you have the same experiment, you have to think about you know, which population is being treated and some of the details of the mechanism to interpret the results of that experiment. And uh, now I want to give a very quick sketch of the kind of theory of this. And it's motivated by the example that I just showed you, where you have two instruments, the same underlying causal relationship, the same data, actually, the same sample, and yet the estimates are very different, and they're different in a kind of economically coherent way. So the framework that I use to think about this is the local average treatment effects framework, and it's a little bit more technical than our discussion so far. Uh, I'm going to go through it quickly because I think a lot of it can be understood by application, but I want to give you the flavor of it. So the local average treatment effects framework starts with a fully heterogeneous world, and in a fully heterogeneous world, individual I has potential outcomes that are indexed against treatment, that's like Y1 and Y0, but also indexed against the instrument. The double indexing of potentials gives me a way to express the exclusion restriction more formally. In particular, I want to clarify what it means to say that there's a single causal channel uh, through which Z the instrument affects Y, the outcomes. So I use double indexing for that. Ultimately, we'll go back to a causal chain that we've seen already, where Z affects D affects Y, and there's no kind of direct arrow there. Okay, that's the exclusion restriction, but I'm gonna work up to that. And another tool that I need besides the double index potentials is latent treatment status indexed against the instrument. So this is a parallel to the Y1, Y0 idea. D1 tells me, do I serve in the military when I'm draft eligible? D1 tells me, do I have a third child when I have a same-sex ship? D0 tells me, do I have a third child when I have a mixed-sex ship? Or when I'm not draft eligible, what do I do? So that's turning the treatment into an outcome, in a sense, indexing it against the instrument. Observed treatment status, of course, is only ever one of those. So now there's a causal effect of the instrument on the treatment. And that's going to give us a causal first stage. OK, but I need some assumptions for that. The first assumption is an independence assumption. The independence assumption says all potentials, that includes potential outcomes, and Latent treatment or potential treatment are independent of the instrument, maybe conditional on covariates. I'm not going to worry about that now. Okay, let's say we don't need covariates for this. In practice, we probably do. So another way of saying this is sex mix, twinning, those are effectively randomly assigned. Okay. Um, well, once I have that little bit of machinery, 
I actually discover that the first stage is a causal effect. E of D given Z equals one minus E of D given Z equals zero. That's my dummy instrument first stage, the regression of D on Z. Because Z is one, I get to see D one. Because Z is zero here, I get to see D zero. That maps into that, that maps into that. But independence tells me, well, once I know it's D1, I don't have to condition on Z anymore. Once I know it's D0, I don't have to condition on Z anymore. Therefore, the first stage is the average causal effect of the instrument on the treatment. So that O6, which is the sex mix first stage, that's the average causal effect of having a, a same-sex sib ship on the probability of having three children. Okay. In the draft lottery case, the 0.16, that's the causal effect of draft eligibility on serving in the Vietnam era armed forces. I also get a causal reduced form. The causal reduced form says, well, when Z is switched on, if I look at the mean of Y, remember double indexation, Z will be one and D will be D one. But these things may be distinct. I am draft eligible, and I'm doing whatever I do as far as service goes, but maybe draft eligibility has a direct effect, so I haven't gotten rid of that yet. Likewise, over here on the zero side. Now I bring in the exclusion restriction, and this makes the exclusion restriction distinct from independence. So one of the things that Imbens and I were trying to fix when we were doing this work is we were confused about what the nature of the underlying assumptions in the simultaneous equations model really mean. So this was our attempt to clarify that. To say that the draft lottery is randomly assigned is a fact about the way lottery numbers were drawn. To say that the draft lottery satisfies exclusion is a, an assumption about human affairs that need not be true even in a world where the draft lottery numbers are known to be randomly assigned. So I'm saying, once I know that you served in the military, it doesn't matter that you had a low draft lottery number. Once I know that you avoided military service, it doesn't matter that you had a low draft lottery number. That takes me back to Y1 and Y0. That's the exclusion restriction. What about sex mix? Once I know that you have a same-sex sib ship, sorry, once I know that you have a third child, it doesn't matter that you have a same-sex sib ship. Once I know that you didn't have a third child, it doesn't matter that you have a same-sex sib ship. These are fun problems to think about. You could see why it's hard to do a good instrument, okay? Because this might be wrong, okay? This might be wrong. Uh, where does it go wrong? Give me a story. Where does it go wrong? Let's do the fertility one. Where does exclusion go wrong? What sort of behavior messes up exclusion for the sex mix instrument? You see what you understand the question? Why does sex mix affect outcomes directly? The mother has children with the same sex We'll want to have their child. Okay, but I'm saying I already know the results of that. I'm, I'm, I'm looking for a channel by which sibling sex composition affects my mother besides the fact that she had my third brother. Think about the economics of the household. Do you have it? Preference. No, let's say there's no son preference in US data. So again, think about, and this is true about my family, but if there's any of you that are in multi-child, you know, sib ships, you could kind of think back to the environment and to ask yourselves, hand-me-downs, yeah. hand okay, flesh it out. It's cheaper to have the same sex. It's cheaper to have same sex. Is that what you were going to say? Well, actually, I was going to say that a woman might be more likely to go working if she has two females at home. Well, actually, the same sex instrument is, it doesn't seem to differ much. Two boys and two girls work the same. What's the ultimate hand-me-down? What's the ultimate economy? Same bedroom. Same bedroom. I shared a bedroom with my middle brother, you know, till we were well into our 30s. <laughs> when I was home, you know. 
Okay, so that's a big economy. Actually, some public housing systems have that like built into the rules that if the household has mixed sex, you get a bigger apartment so that you don't have to have the mixed sex sib ship in the same room. And if you have a same sex, you get a smaller apartment. And then that has an income effect. You're like implicitly wealthier if you can economize on space and you don't need to spend as much money on housing. And then that may reduce labor supply. So that's an example of a violation of the exclusion. We can stipulate that sex is a coin toss. It isn't quite in the sense of being 0.5, but it is pretty random. It's very, other than sex selective abortion, there's not much you can do to change whether you're going to have a male or female. There's nothing reliably that does that other than sex selective abortion. The draft lottery version of this is what? The draft lottery is randomly assigned, but you can have violations of the exclusion restriction. Give me one. Let's do the draft lottery. If it's known that your, you know, your birth date is such, you have a low draft number, a uh, firm might be less willing to hire you because you could get called up. Potentially. So, so whether or not you serve, maybe you're now at risk of, 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 uh, of uh, being called up for the reserves. Okay, that wasn't a huge big deal, but in principle, could be. Uh, another version of that that actually is potentially relevant is men with low draft lottery numbers had an incentive to stay in school because you could be protected from military service by staying in school. And it, uh, that, of course, potentially has a direct effect on your wages, okay? Another thing that men with low draft lottery numbers did is go to Canada. I know I have Canadian friends here. They've heard this story. Okay, so a lot of men with low draft lottery numbers went uh, to Montreal to smoke dope for a decade or so until uh, President Ford let them back. Okay, so that was probably bad for their earnings. But, um, or who knows, maybe they learned French. But the, the um, story there anyway is draft uh, instrumental variables analyst is always on the offensive. It's a long road to hoe. And you want to think about these things yourself and say, what's wrong with my instrument? And then try to come up with some story about how you can check it. So for example, it doesn't actually turn out to be true that for men born 1950 to 53, this is something that Alan Kruger and I looked at in the paper, there isn't actually a big schooling effect. Low draft lottery, in, in principle, it was true, and the media talked a lot about college students avoiding the draft, but you don't see it in the data. So it doesn't turn out that isn't probably an important channel. And not that many people went to Canada, so it's not that important in a national sample. So there are things that you can check. The point is, this, this is distinct from the random assignment of twinning or the random assignment of draft eligibility or six, uh, sex mix. Okay, so, okay. Now the last assumption in the late framework is monotonicity. Monotonicity says the instrument affects everybody the same way if it affects anybody. So there's a weak inequality there. And the reason we need that is it, it, it turns out that if we didn't have something like this, it would be very hard to link the reduced form effect of an instrument with the underlying causal effect if people are both switching in and switching out. Somebody used the term defier, which is the idea that some people with low draft lottery numbers are somehow only avoiding service because of that. Okay, so the monotonicity means the draft lottery maybe doesn't affect me, but if it does affect me, it affects me in the same way. Okay, so I'm gonna skip a little bit of that and just cut to the chase here. Given the assumptions for the uh, late framework, which are independence, exclusion, so independence says the instrument is good as randomly assigned. It, something like twinning, uh, not twinning, or twinning or same sex is randomly assigned. Exclusion says you've got this single channel. It's your endogenous variable. There's no other channel. There's no going around that channel. Uh, that certainly should be more controversial than independence. The, there should be a first stage. So the instrument needs to change fertility, for example. And it should be monotone in the sense that it affects everybody the same way if it affects anybody. It doesn't have to affect everybody. could have zero effects. But if it does affect, uh, if there is a first stage, that has to be 
the same underlying direction of behavior. Given that, you get the late theorem, which is just an interpretive result. It says that this walled formula, which is the ratio of reduced form to first stage, is the average causal effect, y1 minus y0, the average of that e, for people who have d1 greater than d0. So it's an interpretive result. It doesn't lead you to do anything different, but it gives you a tool to understand what you're getting when you use instrumental variables methods, when you do two-stage least squares. In particular, what you're getting, and I'm going to skip the proof of that, is you're getting an average causal effect for a group that we call late compliers. Late compliers have d1 greater than d0. Well, what does that mean? Okay, D is Bernoulli. D is a dummy. So there's only one way that can happen. D1 is greater than D0 when D1 equals 1 and D0 equals 0. That's the only way that can happen. OK. What does that mean? D1 equals 1, D0 equals 0. The instrument is a dummy, so it, it's nice to talk about being switched on. When the instrument is switched on, when I'm draft eligible, I serve. When the instrument is switched off, I don't. If I'm not draft eligible, I don't serve. There are lots of people for whom that statement won't be true, but there are some people for whom it's true. That's the group we learn about. There are other groups that we won't learn about. The group of compliers have D1 equals 1 and D0 equals 0. There's also people who volunteer to serve in the military. So it doesn't matter whether they have a low draft lottery number or not, because they're keen to serve in the military. This is actually most veterans during the Vietnam era in American history. D1 equals D0 equals 1 means the draft lottery is irrelevant to me. D1 equals D0 equals 1 means sibling sex composition is irrelevant to me. I'm going to have three children. I want a big family. Okay. There's also people who avoid military service. Maybe they have a deferment or they're indifferent to sibling sex composition. They never have a third child. They're never takers. So the late assumptions lead to a nice partition of the world into three groups that are of substantive interest that we can say something about. In particular, the causal effect of interest to us, y1 minus y0, we learn about that only for compliers. We learn about that for people whose behavior is changed, whose exposure to treatment is changed. Uh, we won't learn about causal effects for always takers and never takers, though we may be able to describe those populations. Uh, why are these guys called compliers? Well, we have in mind an analogy to a clinical trial. In clinical trials where we measure, for example, the efficacy of a medicine or a treatment, a surgical device or a therapy, people are randomly assigned to be exposed to the experimental treatment, therapy, whatever. Many people who are randomly assigned to be exposed to a new therapy are not compliant. In other words, they don't actually end up receiving that therapy for whatever reason. They change their minds. They don't want to agree to it. Their doctor decides it's a bad idea. It turns out they're not healthy enough for it to be a good idea to expose them to something that may be not very uh, pleasant or effective. So there's a, an endemic problem of compliance in clinical trials. You randomly assign the intention to treat, but you don't actually get the treatment manipulated. Compliers are people who, if they were in a clinical trial and you were randomly assigning the intention to treat, they would be compliant with the treatment protocol. So that's where we came up with that language. And we'll see that that language is incredibly appropriate for what we're interested in in the IV setting. Um, let's go on and look at this in a little more detail. One question that I think is natural to ask in this context is, is late, which is E of Y1 minus Y0 given D1 greater than D0, equal to the effective treatment on the treated? Are these the same? And the answer is mostly not, but sometimes yes. So let's figure that out. Here's a version of that, OK? D equals D0 plus D1 minus D0 times Z. Let's think about this as a, a function of sets. How does D get to be equal to 1? Well, either D0 is equal to 1, but in that case, by monotonicity, D1 is also equal to 1. 
because D1 has to be at least as big as D0. So I'm an always taker. But if I'm an always taker, I'm not a complier. So one way that I get treated is that I'm an always taker. The other way that I get treated is that I'm compliant and the instrument equals one. And therefore, in general, the treated population is the set of always takers plus the set of compliers who are assigned z equals one. And the set of compliers who are assigned z equals one is representative of all compliers because z is independent of potential outcomes. Therefore, in general, the treated population and the, and the compliant populations are not the same, and the daylight between them is generated by the always takers. So if you want the effect of treatment on the treated, you cannot usually use an instrument for that. You cannot usually use an instrument for that because you'll have a group whose behavior, who are treated, but nevertheless, their treatment status is not manipulated, okay? Um, now, there's some things you can learn about the compliers even so. Uh, one of the interesting things about the compliance concept is the treated are visible to you in data. In other words, who had a third child? Well, you can go in the census and you can find out who had a third child. Those women are, can be enumerated, they can be counted, they can be described. The compliers are not individually identified. It's still the case that the distribution of the size of that group and their characteristics is identified. So this is a little bit in the weeds. And for people who are interested, I'll refer you to chapter four of MHE to see how that's done. Let's go back to the randomized trials analogy uh, because I think this is exceedingly important. This is a major problem in clinical research uh, to this day. So often you'll hear about some kind of clinical trial with exciting results. The uh, initial, for example, AIDS uh, 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 therapies uh, had this problem, that the most effective AIDS therapies uh, were being evaluated in randomized trials where many of the group that was randomly assigned to treatment was already very sick and doesn't end up taking the treatment. Plus, the protocol is complicated and patients struggle to follow it. So they're randomly assigned to be treated, but they don't actually end up being treated. Now, people are making a choice when they're not treated. So if I'm choosing not to be treated, even if the original intention to treat is random, the per protocol, as it's called, the protocol compliance decision is not random. So how should such a trial be analyzed? Well. Medical uh, uh, scientists, epidemiologists mostly, have uh, argued about this for uh, as long as there's been clinical trials. The best case scenario, I think, in this literature is intention to treat. You ignore compliance and you just compare people based on the original random assignment. That's called an intention to treat or ITT analysis. So you ignore the fact that not everybody follows the experimental protocol. That preserves the fact that it's ceteris paribus, but you recognize that the treatment effect is diluted by noncompliance, and you fret about that, and you comment on it in your write-up, but you don't really do anything statistical about it. An alternative analysis is what's called per protocol, where you compare people who do actually accept the treatment with the people who didn't get treated, either in the original controls or a mix of the controls and the treatment assigned group. Either way, that's messed up. You've basically thrown away the random assignment when you use per protocol. And I think a lot of epidemiologists have come to understand that, even though initially uh, it was thought to be okay. Now, the point that I wanna make for, for us today is this is not a problem anymore. IV solved this problem. And it's a very neat solution because it's a special case of the late theorem. Let Z be intention to treat, randomly assigned intention to treat. D indicates whether the treatment is received. D is behavior. D is endogenous. D is a choice. Z is random. 
Z satisfies independence because it's random. It probably satisfies exclusion because the only thing that's special about the group that has Z assigned to be one is that they're more likely to be treated. In fact, people who have Z equal to zero mostly have zero probability of treatment because it's an experimental therapy. You can't buy it at CVS. If I'm doing a randomized evaluation of the latest AIDS cocktail or AIDS vaccine, you know, I don't have access to that through the market. So the controls end up with a probability of treatment of zero. Um, so that has a number of implications. First and foremost, the correct way to analyze a randomized trial with imperfect compliance is instrumental variables. Z is the instrument, D is the endogenous variable. And in the usual scenario, where nobody in the control group has access to treatment, the first stage is simply the compliance rate, the probability that I'm treated when Z equals one. ITT is the reduced form, and late is the ratio of ITT to compliance. Late is the ratio of ITT to compliance, and as an extra bonus, late is the effect of treatment on the treated, because I'm saying nobody in the control group has access to treatment, there are no always takers, and therefore all treated are compliant. And in this case, the local average treatment effect is the effect of treatment on the treated, and you have completely solved the problem of per protocol versus intention to treat in a clinical trial. This is a, such a simple idea, very powerful. Uh, first discovered by a friend of mine, Howard Bloom, a social scientist who kind of figured this out on his own, never heard of instrumental variables, did some work on uh, evaluation problems in the 1970s and 80s and kind of came up with this formula. And then later we understood that this is really a version of IV and two stagely square. So I call this the Bloom scenario where there's one-sided compliance. There's no always takers, or you could have no never takers. Uh, this is the waiting for Superman story. It's uh, uh, based on some research that I've done on the effects of, of charter schools. And some of you may have seen the movie uh, Waiting for Superman, and there's a link there in the, in the handout uh, if you get the online version, or you could just Google it and find the movie or find the trailer. So uh, uh, when I'm not uh, teaching you know, short courses, uh, I do a lot of research on labor economics topics, and my main topics for the last few years have been related to schools and school reform. And um, one of the most important kind of themes of American education policy uh, and experimentation and reform has been uh, work on uh, charter schools. Charter schools uh, are essentially publicly funded private schools where uh, uh, most uh, public schools in the US are run by state and uh, city governments. So uh, for example, San Diego has a, uh, the San Diego School District and it's a municipal agency and the people that work for that agency, the teachers and the other employees, they're like police and fire, they're public, public officials and it's funded by local property taxes and uh, it's, it's a very large part of the public sector. Um, charter schools are essentially uh, publicly funded but privately managed schools in public school districts. Uh, if you think that's a controversial idea, you're right. Uh, it's uh, controversial for all sorts of reasons. One is the funding model is uh, if I open a charter, uh, so I could do this, for example, um, I, uh, charters are often themed. So uh, I, I work in Cambridge, which is a town in Massachusetts, across the river from Boston. There's a public school district in Cambridge, Cambridge Public Schools. Uh, I might decide to open a, a charter, uh, the Mostly Harmless Charter Middle School, and it's going to be dedicated to the idea of improving econometric instruction in middle school. And so I would write a proposal. It's kind of like a grant proposal. And there's a state agency that would review it. And now in Massachusetts, this would never uh, pass because Massachusetts has pretty good governance. But you know, in principle, I could get a charter 
and then I would have five years to run a school. And if my school is in Cambridge, I would primarily serve Cambridge residents. And my funding model is that for every city student that I enroll, the regular public schools pay me the average per pupil expenditure of public schools in that district, which is a very large number in Cambridge, over $20,000 PPE in Cambridge per year. So um, that's my funding. So I'm getting funded by the public school district. Essentially, they're paying tuition to me to operate a school that serves their students. Um, another thing that's unusual about charters is uh, they're conditional. So they're granted conditionally and they can be revoked. Uh, and charters are in Massachusetts and in other well-run uh, states with good governance on such matters. Uh, charters that aren't doing well or where the, you know, the manager absconds with the funds uh, are, are closed. Um, so charters can be lost. Uh, another controversial feature of charters is that um, unlike uh, public sector workers, which are uh, mostly uh, members of labor unions, charter teachers are typically not members of labor unions, and many are inexperienced and don't have uh, education credentials that are required of teachers in the public sector. So, um, you know, why might you think this is a good idea? For the same reason that some people think it's a bad idea, you might think it's a good idea. You might think it's a good idea to allow, you know, people like me to teach economics in high school, even though I don't have a teaching certificate and I'm not qualified to teach economics in high school in Cambridge uh, as a professor, but somebody without an education degree. And other things uh, uh, that are relevant are it's easier to hire and fire uh, teachers in charters. Um, anyway, uh, you know, I, I don't particularly have a dog in the fight in terms of the principle here, but I am very interested in the actual consequences of going to alternative school models. And uh, you could evaluate this problem by simply comparing the test scores, say, of, of people who do and don't go to charter schools in districts like Boston and New York and Cambridge and um, on the West Coast, you have San Francisco and Oakland and uh, uh, Los Angeles that have a large charter sector. Often when you do that, you see that the kids in charter schools tend to do better than the urban control group. Uh, but the problem is it isn't really a control group. The kids in the charter schools are self-selected or really it's their parents. So their parents are motivated enough and, and aware enough that there exists this charter alternative, and that tends to be a positively selected group. And so we'd like to fix that problem. And the answer to that is actually uh, kind of uh, an interesting institutional feature of the education reform world. In the United States, many large urban districts use an element of random assignment to decide who goes to school where. This is true both within the traditional public sector like within the Boston public schools and within the New York City schools, there's an element of random assignment, but it's particularly true in the charter sector where oversubscribed charter schools, that means there's more applicants than seats, oversubscribed charter schools must use lotteries in Massachusetts and some other states to pick their students. They're not allowed to screen the students based on test scores or family background. So, Here's what that looks like in terms of IV, okay? So this is IV for the effects of a KIPP school. KIPP is a particular charter operator, and I know I'm overloading you with detail here, but every application has its context. KIPP is what's called a charter management organization. It's kind of like a franchise. It runs a particular model of charter school the charter schools that KIPP run are what my colleagues and I call no excuses charter schools. And they have a kind of a paradigm. Long day, long year, emphasis on traditional reading and math, uniforms and comportment, low stakes incentives. Uh, and they use a lot of Teach for America interns and they use a lot of inexperienced, uncredentialed teachers who will leave education. Okay, so, and it, it's a particular paradigm that uh, researchers have been interested in because it's scalable and it seems to have very good effects. And here's some IV evidence. So this is really the Wald formula applied to KIPP data. These are applicants to the first KIPP school in New England 
for sixth grade seats, and some are offered a seat, 253, and some are not. Test scores are standardized to the state mean. The school is in the town of Lynn, Massachusetts. Lynn is a working class kind of down, down on its luck suburb north of Boston. And the kids in Lynn are mostly minority. It's actually a heavily Hispanic district. Lottery losers in Lynn have test scores that are about a third of a standard deviation below the Massachusetts mean, which is typical for a high minority low income district relative to the rest of the state. Lottery winners score at the state mean, which is an impressive result. So this being zero, it's a standardized test score. So lottery winners score at the state mean. Therefore, the difference here is about 0.36 sigma. Let me put it over here. 0.36 sigma in favor of lottery winners. Not everybody who wins the lottery goes to KIPP because that's kind of the parent there wanting to get you to apply to the lottery, but then the kid maybe gets out of it, changes his or her mind. The first stage is 79% of lottery winners enroll and about 5% of lottery losers enroll, mostly by applying again. So the first stage there is 0.74. The outcome is math a year after application. IV is the ratio of reduced form to first stage. 0.48 sigma per year of exposure achievement gain. So this is a spectacular result. Half a standard deviation of achievement gain one year later. And it more or less scales linearly, as we've shown. The no excuses model produces very, very large gains for low income, mostly non-white students uh, in the urban districts that it serves. Why is this relevant methodologically? Because there are very few always takers. The probability of going to KIPP when you lose the lottery is very low. And therefore, most treated KIPP kids are compliers. And so you can think of this as E of Y1 minus Y0 given D equals 1. It is more or less the effect of treatment on the treated, the effect of going to KIPP for kids who went there. Kids who go to KIPP score at the state mean, and they otherwise would have done very poorly if they had not gone to KIPP. And that's a rigorous causal statement that exploits instrumental variables. This is explained in further detail in the handout, but I think that's enough to give you the basic idea. It's a lot of fun to work on this because it's very much in the news, in the headlines. The results are interesting, controversial, convincing, and worth paying attention to. And that's, of course, uh, when econometrics is at its best. Mm -hmm.